is God a respecter of persons? That is, does he favor some people and ensure their salvation while excluding others? And perhaps even does nothing for them, or even worse, causes some people to be lost. A Christian young lady recently told me, she said, I no longer believe as you do. And I asked her what she meant by that. Do you mean that you are an atheist? Have you joined a denomination? Are you agnostic? What do you mean? She sent me two links to two books. She said that if I would read these books, that I would understand where she was coming from. The first book was by a a man named Bart Ehrman. He wrote the book called Forged. Now, he is a textual critic, and he argues that we can't trust our modern Bibles. He says because we don't have the originals that were written by the apostles. He says we don't even have copies of the originals or copies of the copies, and so we don't know how much they've been changed or altered, and through the uh, centuries, what has happened is scribes have made additions and taken out parts, and so we don't know what the Word of God, what the Bible originally said. The second book that this young lady referenced was a book by Rachel Held Evans. The book is entitled Faith Unraveled, and it has a subtitle, how a girl who knew all the answers learned to ask questions. Now, I just finished reading the second book. This particular author, Miss Evans, is a best-selling author. She was. She passed away at age 37. But in this particular book, she tells about how her faith fell apart. Miss Evans says that she was raised in a very conservative Baptist home, Her daddy was a preacher. She said she grew up doing Bible drills and learning apologetics and quoting Scripture and defending the faith, and she went to a faith-based Christian college. But in 2001, she says everything changed for her. Now, there's just two points that I want to make in this short study. The first point I have entitled, The Loathing God the loathing God. You'll understand why in just a minute. She says in 2001, everything changed. I'm going to read to you some excerpts from her book because I really want you to get this, because this particular book has impacted a lot of young people, and the concept that this young lady grappled with has impacted a lot of young and old people. She said, It was just before the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in 2001, and the press had been airing a series of crude home videos depicting the human rights abuses of the Taliban. I watched as a woman enshrouded in a heavy blue burqa. She says she's rolled in. Then, she says, from the left-hand corner of the screen, an executioner approached the woman methodically lifted his gun to the back of her head and fired. She says, I later learned that her name was Zarmina. CNN repeatedly aired the tape, perhaps to make us feel better about going to war against the Taliban. She says, but it wasn't the Taliban that I was angry with. Each time I watched Zarmina's execution, I got angrier and angrier with God. God was the one who claimed to have formed as Armina in her mother's womb. It was God who ordained that she be born in a third world country under an oppressive regime. God had all the power and resources at his disposal to stop this from happening, and yet he did nothing. Worst of all, 20 years of Christian education assured me that because Zarmina was a Muslim, she would suffer unending torment in hell for the rest of eternity. Suddenly, abstract concepts about heaven and hell, election and free will, religious pluralism and exclusivism had a name, Zarmina. I felt like I could come to terms with Sarmina's suffering if it were restricted to this lifetime. 
if I knew that God would grant her some sort of justice after death, but the idea that this woman passed from agony to agony, from torture to torture, from a lifetime of pain and sadness to an eternity of pain and sadness, all because she had less information about the gospel than I did, seemed cruel, even sadistic. I wondered how many millions of people like Zarmina died every day in similar circumstances. Was I supposed to believe that all these people went to hell because they weren't Christians? If salvation is available only to Christians, then the gospel isn't good news at all. For most of the human race, it is terrible news, but that's not fair. How was she supposed to know any different? All her life, she was taught that Islam is the only true religion, just like we were taught all of our lives that Christianity is the only true religion. God didn't really give her a chance. Now, friends, did you notice some key phrases in what she wrote? In this short excerpt, she refers to God as cruel, sadistic. She mentions the hands of an angry God. That's why I have entitled this the loathing God, because a God like the one that she describes would be cruel and sadistic. But you know, the more I have studied my Bible, the more I have reached the absolute opposite conclusion that she did. Here's the second point that I want to talk about, and that is the longing God. The longing God. The word longing means anxious, eager, craving. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I want you to think very deeply with me for just a moment while I describe for you the God of the Bible. Revelation 13 and verse 7 speaks about the second person of the Godhead as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. That means that before God created this world, He had already determined that He would die for us. The things He was going to endure, He was going to do them for us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Luke 22, 44, we see Jesus in the garden. He's in agony with sweat drops of blood. He's dreading what was ahead of him that he was doing for us. Luke 19 and verse 10, Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Listen to this passage from the Old Testament. Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 17, talking about the, the Jews, they refused to obey and they were not mindful of your wonders, that is God's wonders, that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and in their rebellion they appointed a leader to return to their bondage. That is, they rejected you. You did these great things and these great wonders, but they hardened their, their necks, uh, they rebelled against you, but keep reading. But you are a God ready to pardon gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abundant in kindness, and you did not forsake them. Now, someone might say, but what about those people who weren't born amongst God's people? What if you weren't born today in the United States of America? What if you were born in a Muslim country? I want you to consider with me the book of Jonah. In Jonah's day, the people of Nineveh, the Ninevites, were a cruel, heartless, godless people. They were Gentiles. What chance in the world did they have of learning about the true God? Listen to what the Bible says. Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1, But the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amite, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. That is, 
God said, go to these people. Now, you know the story of Jonah. Jonah flees. He eventually is thrown into the sea. He is swallowed up by the great sea creature, and reluctantly, he goes to Nineveh. And the people of Nineveh, they repent in sackcloth and ashes. But when you get to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. And so he prayed to the Lord. That is, Jonah was prejudiced. He is racist. He did not want these people to be saved. He hated them. And so it displeased him exceedingly. He became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, For I know that you are a gracious and a merciful God. Now listen how he describes God. I know that you're a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm, Jonah 4, 1 and 2. You know, I have wondered how many other Gentile cities maybe had similar stories, but they're not recorded in the Bible. I don't, I don't know. This one's recorded because we need it. Were there others like this? I suspect that there were. If God cared about saving the Ninevites, why would we think that He doesn't care about people today? Let me tell you about the longing God. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, For since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes, that is, God's invisible attributes, are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, what does that mean? The creation itself is a testimony to the honest mind that God exists. We can know that God exists by the things that are made. I read an article recently that stated that mankind seems to be born to believe in God. In fact, it begins like this. It says, it might surprise the reader that both atheists and theists overwhelmingly admit that humans are predisposed to believe in an intelligent creator of some sort. The atheist Richard Dawkins wrote this. He said, though the details differ across the world, no known culture lacks some version of the time-consuming... In fact, listen how he describes religion because he has disdain for it. He says, time-consuming, it's wealth-consuming, hostility-provoking rituals, the anti-factual, counterproductive fantasies of religion. So deeply religious are humans. Dawkins refers to their desire to recognize some sort of a creator as, quote, a lust for gods. Renowned atheist Sam Harris, he was forced to admit the truth that the concept of God is inherent in the human predisposition. Now, what does that mean? He looked at the evidence and he said, man just seems predisposed to believe in God. In light of current evidence, Bloom admitted there is by now a large body of research suggesting that humans are, listen to this phrase, natural-born creationist. Very interesting. God has not left us without witness. We're natural-born creationists. Acts 17 and verse 26 says, And he, God, has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Now listen to verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7, the promise is made, if you'll seek, you will find. Jeremiah 29, 13, and you will seek me and find me when you seek for me with all of your heart. So what does all this mean? You put all of this together, and what you have is we have a God who died for us. He paid the penalty 
for us. He surrounded us with evidence that proves his existence. He created within me an inborn understanding that he's there. He pre-programmed me to believe in God. In fact, I have to have it taught out of me. And then he providentially provides a way for me to be saved. If I am truly seeking, he assures me I will find. Now, what about after I become a Christian? I do what the Bible says to become a child of God. My sins are washed away. I'm a Christian. What now? Some Christians live their lives in constant fear. They believe that their Christian life involves being saved and lost and saved and lost, and they're constantly afraid that they're going to have a, an evil thought and they're going to die and be lost for all eternity. They never embrace the promise of 1 John 1, 7 through 9, the continual cleansing of the blood of Jesus. They never accept the words of 1 John 5, 13, where John promises that we can know that we have eternal life, not hope that we have eternal life, not wait and see, not that there's no way of knowing. We can know, and we can have the peace of mind that comes with knowing. You know, I have often said that I believe that in the church, sometimes we have done a good job of convincing Christians that they are lost, but we haven't always done as good a job of convincing people that they are saved. And sometimes that misery drives people away. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, the Bible says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, whoever fears him. Listen, in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Dear friend, we would love to study with you about the love of God that he has for us and the plan that he has provided that we may go to heaven.